one of the things I've been wrestling with in, in the present is, of course, we have been divided into two camps about everything, right? And the camps aren't, you know, it's sometimes you fall in different, uh, on different sides based on different divisions. But nonetheless, there is a, a kind of, um, COVID isn't that serious. This is a, an excuse for authoritarianism, right? That's like a camp. Mm -hmm. Right. And then there's a COVID is very serious and this is about public health, you dummies. Right. And the point is, neither of these things are right. Well, those, those are two camps that have, those are categories. Those are sets that are not empty. People belong, people, Many people believe people, those most things. People, most, most people fall but, into but one it's, of those. But those two things do not a, a solution, a complete solution set make. Right. Exactly. And, and that's what I'm getting at is yeah. COVID is extremely frightening. And the fact that it probably has an at least somewhat non-natural origin makes it even more frightening because it means it's harder to predict what it's going to do, right? right. Well, um, and, and, and add to that that we still aren't fully allowed to talk about what that means about policy with regard to future research and gain-of-function research. and Right, and how know, did like this how, come to how, be... How will such a thing be avoided in the future if we can't talk about origins? Right, and to the extent that there appears to be a very credible uh, argument that gain-of-function research taking place in Wuhan was the result of Americans circumventing their own legal ban on gain-of-function research and funneling res uh, resources to Wuhan in order to get the work done, how is it possible that one of the people in charge of our pandemic response is also one of the people responsible for you know, whether or not this is where the virus came from, one of the people responsible for um, circumventing that ban. There's no way Anthony Fauci should be in charge of our pandemic response, no matter what. So but, just to that end, let me say, um, I recommend listening to Josh Rogan on Barry Weiss's Honestly podcast. There's a two-part um, discussion of, uh, of basically how China's role in um, in changing the narrative that we are all engaged in and and they talk about this and it's 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 a remarkable sort of conversation so i'm not quite done with the second one but well i'm, I'm looking forward uh, yeah. to listening to it myself um i will say we have to ask the question to what extent are the narratives that we are battling over being fed to us by something that does not have our navigating the pandemic well um you know at its core mm -hmm. and doesn't mean that we are being fed narratives from somewhere else, but it's at least a possibility. And that would explain in part why we are managing it so badly if that were uh, shifting our our view and our approach. Narr but narrative control is uh, um, an incredibly powerful kind of control because it doesn't require the infrastructure. It doesn't require physical movement of things in this, in this day and age. Right. Um, yeah, and yes, the, the opportunity for it obviously exists. Yeah. And so what are the chances that that opportunity is not being utilized, right, or has been Someone, completely neutralized yeah. is pretty low chance. But in any case, what, what I would say is the two camps are clearly both wrong, right? Those two camps, uh, COVID is not a real thing. and COVID anyone, is not serious. Or, yeah, it's, it's not serious. Um, this and, is an excuse for authoritarianism. And, and the other camp being? Being COVID is extremely serious and the authoritarianism isn't authoritarianism, it's public health. Okay, so those right? two camps are both wrong. They're both wrong, mm -hmm. right? It is quite clear that COVID is a very dangerous disease. I mean, it's really, it's like physiologically diabolical, mm -hmm. right? What it does to the body long COVID, all of these things, it is not to be trifled with. Yeah. The ground glass opacities in the lungs alone. Are, yeah. Right. No. On the other hand, it does seem to be the um, excuse for an awful lot of authoritarianism that makes no sense, right? Mm -hmm. And in, in, in one way, actually, I think uh, there's a litmus test, right, that we can use to detect that there is something about this that is just absolutely not public health and incoherent, mm -hmm. right? Um, not only is it the case that there's nothing about the current policy, even if everybody were to comply completely, that actually brings SARS-CoV-2 under control, right? It can't do that even in principle. Um, but there's also this issue. I probably should have prepared with a uh, diminishing returns graph. But um, the, the fact is diminishing returns is a feature of any complex system in which there is an objective, 
right? There are complex systems that have no objective. Uh, uh, weather is a complex system in which there's no objective. And so you can't say that there are diminishing returns in in the case of weather because um, because there's no there's no there's no such thing as a return. Yeah. So you want to show this? Zach, you can show my screen. So this is actually a figure from the final chapter of our book. Um, so you, this you is want a, to describe it for people just listening. Sure. This is a simplified diminishing returns curve. And uh, basically, if you imagine, um, so uh, the X axis is investment, the Y axis is return. There is a uh, a shallow early phase that then curves up and becomes a steep, effectively a cliff face, and then uh, in which your investment is low relative to the returns that you get for it. Right. So right. We the, call the that, early the early stages. I'm trying to figure out what it is. Right. Like what am, I'm learning how to skateboard or whatever it is, right. and it's tough at first, and then you hit some point like, oh, I'm getting this, I'm getting this, I'm getting this, and then what happens at the inflection point in the you, curve? You um you get the emergence of a plateau where larger and larger investments and that smaller and smaller gains. Yeah. And, and it's not. I mean, it's not. In some cases, it will be, but um, we didn't mean for it to be drawn exactly as a plateau. Yeah, like there's, no, there's a, a little bit of, it's of an asymptote. growth. It's an asymptote. There's still there's still returns on investment, but yeah. they get less and less. Yeah. Anyway, the, the the point is the reason that you get a diminishing returns curve in a complex system in which there's an objective is that you have a hierarchy of interventions. Right, you've got some stuff that's actually no brainers that work really well. And you do those things first, obviously, because why wouldn't you? And the point is, the more of those things you've already done, the more of the low-hanging fruit you've uh, you've found, the more you're forced to do things that, yes, work, but at some very large cost. And so, anyway, you get this pattern reliably because a reasonable a reasonable person or system attempting to solve a problem will go after the low-hanging fruit first, will find it, and will be left with smaller and smaller interventions that are more and more expensive, eventually getting to a point um, of near pointlessness. Mm -hmm. um, but in any case, the point is, our response to COVID does not show an indication that we have gone after the low-hanging fruit at all. Mm. Right, it's completely insane with respect to the low-hanging fruit that we have left on the table and not invoked. And this is left, for instance. Well, for instance, um, the most obvious one, and the thing that I would suggest that we use as a litmus test is the question. Hold on a second, hey Z, could I get my screen back? Thank you. Is yeah. the question of uh, vitamin D? There it is. Now, the vitamin D question is not simple. It's not a simple matter of take vitamin D, avoid COVID. Right, you can take vitamin D and still get COVID, but it is a matter of the evidence strongly suggests that vitamin D deficiency makes you much more vulnerable to COVID. This is completely unambiguous, and that what's more, that people who live far from the equator, as many of us do, are very likely to be vitamin D deficient during the winter months. Why? Because vitamin D is naturally produced on the skin in response to sunlight. And so what that means is that vitamin D deficiency, which might not be inherent to humans, is very common amongst modern humans because of the way we live, because we spend a lot of time indoors, because many of us live uh, in cold climates where climate control allows us to continue, but we are then uh, chronically underexposed to sunlight that would produce vitamin D, and therefore vitamin D supplementation has tremendous value in terms of fending off COVID for people who are likely to experience deficiencies. What's more, vitamin D is inexpensive, Vitamin D is readily available, and vitamin D, not only does it not have serious downsides, but if you take reasonable amounts of vitamin D, you are very likely to fend off other diseases because vitamin D deficiency makes you, uh, it's basically immunosuppressive. Just uh, one one comment, there is the possibility of overdosing in vitamin yes. D because it's fat soluble. Because it's fat soluble right. and not water soluble, it is possible to take too much. So be mindful, but the yep. point is, Many of us have vitamin D deficiencies in the winter. They have impacts on our health that are negative, those deficiencies do. There's probably little or no advantage of having more than enough vitamin D, but getting to the point that you do not have a deficit of it makes a great deal of sense. And yet we are somehow still not 
widely recommending vitamin D to everybody who's likely to have that deficiency in the winter in spite of the fact that we have a raging pandemic um, and we could reduce the number of cases substantially by simply making that one intervention. Yeah. So Now, and there's, uh, sorry to interrupt for just a second, I was just, this, uh, one of my posts on natural selections, I was specifically talking about vitamin D. This is the hospital's post. Um Vitamin, uh, you don't have to show this. Um, vitamin D, or you can, whatever. Um, vitamin D has been identified, and this is just a short list, as having effects beneficial to the individual with regard to immunity, autoimmunity, cardiovascular disease, cancer, fertility, pregnancy, and dementia, among other things. And here I um, link to a 2013 review article, um, Vitamin D Effects on Musculoskeletal Health, Immunity, et cetera, et cetera, a review of recent evidence. So, you know, it's just, it's, it's, one of these sort of you know wonder wonder molecules at some level um, that yes you can overdo it but it's very much more likely that you have effectively underdone it uh, yes. with regard to where you live you can overdo it and yeah. above a level where you have adequate amounts of vitamin D it probably does you very little good but the point is many of the cases of covid that people get are downstream of deficiencies where they wouldn't have gotten the case or would have been much better off if they had had vitamin D so the question yeah. is how on earth is this not our first recommendation to people that you, if you have any danger of a vitamin D deficiency, that you do something about it that includes um, making vitamin D while the sun shines by going outside and exposing yourself to sunlight. And as that becomes less and less uh, useful as an intervention, supplementing with uh, biologically available vitamin D that would compensate for a deficiency. So I would say that's a litmus test. Why is it a litmus test? Because it's the lowest hanging fruit on so the tree. So remind us again, that was just, I I, I, I followed that circle, but uh, we're now talking about low hanging fruit with regard to, you know, why is the pandemic response not encouraged people to do the obvious, inexpensive, clearly useful things such as go outside, be active, supplement, supplement with vitamin D if there's any reason to suspect that you are deficient in it. Those are right. some low hanging fruit recommendations, public health recommendations that enrich no one, right. but contribute greatly to public health. Right. There is no good reason not to address the question of vitamin D deficiency first. It's the lowest hanging fruit. It should have been our first, our first intervention. And the fact that we didn't do it is evidence of one of two things. It is either evidence of absolutely jaw-dropping levels of incompetence, which is possible, or that something else is driving our policy that isn't really obsessed with preventing COVID. Um, and we don't know which it is, but I mean, let's say it's the better of them. It's jaw-dropping incompetence. Well, but it's the kind of incompetence that can be fixed at any moment. You know, all, you know, any one of these organizations can start saying, on top of everything else, and maybe most of what we're telling you is garbage, but you really ought to consider <laughs> vitamin D. Your vitamin like D. This, well, it, this is just something that you can add at any moment. It's not like, well, that ship has sailed. We can't start recommending vitamin D now. Like, no, it's not like that. So, I mean, but what happens at the CDC when somebody who didn't get the memo shows up at the meeting and is like, hey, I've got a great idea. Check <laughs> out how effective vitamin D is for people who are deficient, this is a, a, a spectacular intervention. It really prevents a lot of cases of COVID. Let's just recommend it because at least we can all agree on that, right? And then what, what happens? What kind of crickets? Like, how does that not... Vitamin D deficient crickets. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe. Yes. Uh, so in any case, uh, when the lowest hanging fruit on the tree has not been picked, something is up that at least amounts to jaw-dropping incompetence. Yeah. That's, that's the, the shallow end. Thank <laughs> you.